Best Book Bits podcast brings you Jeremy Harbour, founder and CEO of Unity Group, a private equity firm specializing in helping entrepreneurs grow their small to medium enterprises. He's an expert in mergers and acquisitions, having bought and sold over 50 firms, as well as ad advised of more than 200 deals. Founder of the Harbour Club, which trains entrepreneurs globally on how to do deals. Author of multiple books, including Go Do, and my favorite, Go Do Deals. Jeremy, thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much for having me. No problem at all. Now, first I want to say congratulations on uh, all your success so far. Uh, your life resume so far is one of hard work and amazement, so congratulations. Now we'll deep dive into Go Do Deals soon, but for my audience who don't know your story, take us back to growing up in a salon and selling flowers to the ladies getting their haircuts. Yeah, so uh, when I was growing up, uh, I, I grew up on a, a little farm in uh, a place called Dorset in the south of England. So I'm uh, the son of a farmer and uh, both, both uh, my parents were kind of self-employed, which I think was an important lesson for me because it kind of showed there is a, you know, I think most people went to school and were told you kind of, you know, you work for a big company or you work for the government. And I, I, I you know, I was taught at a young age, or you can do what you want, um, I guess, which is a, a third way. Um, and so both my parents ran their own business. My dad was a farmer. My mum had a salon. Um, and I could always work in either of those businesses for pocket money, you know, for uh, a little bit of pocket money. Well, of course, that spurned my kind of creativity to figure out how can I earn more because they would give me like a pound for an hour's work. Well, how do I get more than a pound for an hour? So I'd always try and come up with things. And yeah, one of them when I was very young was chopping down all the flowers in the garden, putting them in jam jars and selling them to the ladies coming to the salon. I was also that annoying kid at school that kept trying to, you know, flog absolutely anything. And I, I had quite a line in uh, uh, watches and jewellery and candy or sweets. Um, so uh, I remember buying 2,400 Cadbury's cream eggs from the Cadbury's factory shop. And then uh, it took me months going to school. I didn't used to take books or paper or pens or anything into school. I used to take boxes of Cadbury's cream eggs. So, um, yeah, I was uh, yeah always flogging stuff from a young age. So it was... Uh, Definitely uh, um, uh, the kind of uh, whatever it is, na nature, not nurture. Yeah, absolutely. And you left school at the age of 15 to, to run a business. What, what was his business? Yeah, so I was uh, I had a weekend market stall selling watches and jewellery. And uh, my grandmother was really supportive in that she used to take me there at like 6 a.m., drop me off, and I'd set my stall up and then come pick me up again at the end of the uh, end of the day on the, on the weekends. Um, and uh, basically that was, that started to do really, really well. I was actually wholesaling the other uh, market traders with uh, with their watches and jewelry as well, as well as having my own stall. I seemed to be able to negotiate better deals than they could um, on the on the purchase of the of the stuff. And also when I bought in bulk, I got a much better price. So if I shared out a, a, an order between several uh, vendors, um, it effectively brought my own costs down. So um, yeah, I, I kind of, uh, left school to pursue that. It, it was quite interesting because that business, just like any startup, I guess, consists, you know, constantly changes. And actually that business evolved into somehow supplying amusement machines to pubs and clubs and, and takeaways and stuff. And that business ultimately went bust when I was 19. So, um, actually there was a kind of, um, a baptism of fire, you know, the, uh, as an entrepreneur and a good dose of humility. I think, you know, um, most entrepreneurs learn the most from failure, but don't like to talk about it. And I think, um, you know, it, it's really healthy to have that kick in the nuts, but, you know, one for your own bravado, because it calms you down a bit, <laughs> but also from the lessons and things that you take away from it. And it's definitely served me so well in, in future businesses after that. Yeah. And thanks for sharing. A lot of people don't share their failures. Um, well, a lot of people do when they become successful, but as you know, being a success for yourself, it's easy to go back and, and look at some of the challenges as well. You also had a, you know, a people moment at the age of 10 where a lot of kids uh, wouldn't um, have that moment. Do you want to share what happened when you were 10 that sort of changed your life as well? Yeah, so I, I think, um, yeah, I mean, obviously when I, was, when I was 10 years old, my older brother died. Um, he was 14 um, and no particular reason. It was like a sudden adult death syndrome, um, which in a way made it even worse because then, you don't know if you're next. And of course they took me to the hospital and I was wired up to loads of machines for a couple of days to see if there was any you know, weird things going on with me. Um, and uh, and of course you don't know if there was because I, I'm sure if they told my parents, they wouldn't have told me. <laughs> so uh, again, you kind of have this horrible feeling like tomorrow is gonna be your last or today's gonna be your last day. And, uh, but I think that was also quite motivational. It made me really wanna get on and do stuff at a much younger age than perhaps other people because I had this, uh, 
you know, this kind of um, close affinity to, to, to death, I guess, if you want to put it in quite a dark way. And also, I mean, my grandmother was one of 14 kids and they were all older than her. And so she died when she was 100. But, but throughout my uh, kind of teenage life, I was constantly going to family funerals. Um, and so for me, it was quite, you know, uh, common. And then I, you know, I, I started meeting people who were in their 30s who'd never had anyone close to them pass away. And, uh, and that astonished me because I'd seen so much of it grow, growing up. And I do think that, you know, does that does change your perception of life and does motivate you and does show you the finite nature uh, uh, of life and um, and actually we also had the family home was repossessed when I was 12 years old so my parents they went from losing a child to losing a home uh, in the space of a couple of years um, I literally I'm a, I'm a father now of two young children I cannot imagine going through that kind of turmoil um, and you know they're, they're still together 50 got 54 years married or something like this um, you know uh, and, and still going strong that's also really inspirational to me you know that uh, that, that I have that uh, you know that to look up to yeah well and, and, and nothing to do with your choices just things that happened uh, to you through there can you um let's fast forward to some of the good stuff so your first uh, business in the in the telco business can you can you tell us how that started yeah, absolutely. So um, in the 1990s, uh, mobile phones were getting smaller. Um, they went from kind of the size of a house brick to the size of a, a chocolate bar. And um, it got very, uh, uh, they became very popular. I think um, uh, the Department of Trade and I Industry in the UK, which, which no longer exists, but I think they estimated the total potential market for mobile phones in the UK to be about 3 million. Um, and within about three years, there was 40 million of them. So um, the, the, the whole industry had exploded beyond anyone's expectations. Um, and as a consequence, there were thousands of startups in the mobile and fixed line telephony uh, space. And, and I was one of them. So uh, I jumped on the bandwagon and started selling mobile phones to people. I decided to specialize in supplying small to medium sized businesses, which is something that's a recurring theme in my whole uh, career is, is supporting SMEs. Um, and also, it was just an unloved sector. The retailers were booming, so there was lots of opportunity for uh, you know the, the customer in the high street. The networks were very good at the corporate sales, so dealing with the large uh, corporate customers. But as in so many cases, the SMEs were kind of left to rot in the middle. So we, we provided a firm that specialised in looking after their uh, telecoms needs and almost being like a virtual telecoms manager for them. Um, that business grew pretty quickly. Um, and then actually the market itself, the whole telecommunications market around, around about sort of um, I guess 99, 2000 sort of time, um, started to consolidate quite rapidly. So where, where it got very fragmented and there were lots and lots of uh, uh, providers, all of those companies started kind of eating each other. So they were you know, consolidating into a, a smaller number of bigger uh, companies because people realized they could acquire customers instead of uh, going out and trying to win people over because um, getting people to switch from one provider was quite hard but to pick up an already subscribed contracted customer um, was much much easier so um, it was fascinating for me because I think as an entrepreneur I mean remember at this point I've been running businesses for you know quite some time in my in, you know from my youth onwards and um, uh, and for me, it was just fascinating because I'd read tons of books, I'd watched seminars, listened to tapes, done all, you know, all of these kind of uh, things to educate myself and to try and understand business. And I basically played around with three key levers in business, which was sales, marketing, and team. And I basically felt that everything that you achieved in a business was basically as a, as a result of playing with those three levers. Now, all of a sudden, I'm sitting in a room with a guy sitting opposite me who's trying to buy my company, and he's about to grow by my my life's work, you know, the three years or four years that we put into that business, um, he's going to grow by that amount in you know the day we sign the contract. So uh, there's me thinking, well, shit, this is like a, a bit of a shortcut. This is uh, you know maybe you don't have to run the marathon. Maybe you can just run the last ten yards, and they they still give you a medal. Um, and so uh, one of the things that I spotted was that uh, you know. Uh, I, I knew I didn't have money to go and buy a company, you know, I, and I knew that the bank wouldn't lend me money because I would be a horrible credit risk. You know, I, I had I had choices at the end of the month, like whether to pay my credit card bill or pay my staff. There wasn't this big pot of cash. It was a fast growth bootstrapped uh, business that I was in, and there was no way that it could support external uh, kind of um, 
uh, money going out. Um, but what I realized is the guy sitting opposite me, he didn't have any money either. <laughs> so he was trying to structure a transaction that used as little of his own cash as possible, um, or, or none if, if possible, um, but, but solve a whole bunch of problems for me and, and, uh, and, and win me over uh, in that way. And so I just thought, shit, you know, maybe I should be the buyer and not the seller. Um, now, I was very young. Uh, I, looked, I, I looked younger than I was, which was always a handicap for me in business. Uh, uh, in, in my early days. And so I, I ran around to, I used to go to lots of networking events because um, the great thing about going to a networking event when you have a telecoms company is everybody uses a phone. So every every potential person you meet is a potential customer. So um, all I did was I switched my pitch from how much do you spend on your phone to um, uh, I'm in, you know, I have a mobile phone company and I'm looking to buy another one. Um, now, what was interesting is prior to that, I was kind of like a hunter. So although my business card said managing director, I was it should have said glorified salesman because all I was doing at every networking meeting was just going in like a shark to flog people mobile phones. And the only thing that interested me is how much they spent on their phone bills and how many phones they had. And I was a, like a, a one track record. Now, when I went into these meetings and I said that I'm interested in buying other companies, suddenly they're like, fuck, this guy might be interesting. You know, he's, he's buying companies. He must be like, you know, loaded or something so um, it would it would you'd find you have these way more engaging way more interesting conversations in those networking uh, environments and actually fun funnily enough that led to even more business i ended up closing more telephone sales because i wasn't talking about selling them telephones so it's an, an interesting idea perhaps for some of your for some of your listeners but um the uh the the interesting thing was i found a company uh, it was distressed. It had some problems, but it had it had uh, about a thousand active uh, handsets across six hundred customers. Had some great clients. One of them was Nintendo, so they had Nintendo as a as a customer. Um, and I was able to structure a deal with that business where I didn't put any cash into it. We didn't spend anything on legal fees. We did the whole contract as a basically a letter that we both signed, agreeing what the terms were um, and I grew by a year's worth of sales in an afternoon. Um, you know, it would have taken my company a year to do that thousand connections and we did it in a day and I didn't risk any capital. And actually telling you this story now, I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck standing up because I remember the euphoria of like peeking behind that curtain and seeing this whole new world I never knew existed <laughs> um, and, uh, and getting really, really excited about it. I was driving, uh, I was driving this little van that I'd hired with all, the, uh, uh, all of the stock in the back of it that I'd picked up from this acquisition uh, and driving it back to our offices and, uh, and literally floating. I mean, I was like on cloud, uh, cloud nine on the way back and ideas just buzzing around my head. And what was fascinating is two weeks later, I did my second deal. You know, once I had, once I'd figured it out, it kind of just clicked. And so we went from a million of revenue and 20 staff uh, uh, in, uh, to doing the second deal two weeks later. 18 months later, we'd done 12 deals and we'd gone from a million and 20 staff to 13 and a half million and 135 staff. And what was astonishing to me is I went from uh, not being able to pay, uh, when we were negotiating this deal, I couldn't find two and a half grand to give the guy up front. He was insisting he wanted two and a half grand up front and I couldn't lay my hands on two and a half grand. 18 months later, my payroll was a quarter of a million pounds. So 250 grand would go out the, <laughs> go out the door every month. And those months came around really, really quick. <laughs> so um, it was just an astonishing um, uh, yeah, growth curve once, once we cracked it. Yeah, it's an amazing story. And I was going to ask you some questions about um, how you approached every week about selling your business to another company, but you obviously spoke about that with, with no money down and, and then you learned the art of what they call deal structures as well. Um, one of the stories I, I wanted to ask you, talk to me um, about the story of the IT company you bought for one pound while interviewing the guy for an IT account manager role and how you were tuned into Deal FM and others were not. So talk about the power of sort of Deal FM and how that story unfolded. It was a, a great one in the book. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah, I mean, basically what happened, I'd, I'd closed this mobile phone company and, uh, and I'd come back to the office 
and I met up with my operations director, actually, you know, the whole team, but the operations director particularly, um, because this was going to be integrated into the, you know, into the company. Um, and I talked about how fantastic this was and how amazing it was that we'd uh, we'd done this acquisition, and then talked about how we, you know, we really need to go and find another one. And uh, in, you know, I was I was super excited, so I was like, we could buy anything, you know, we could go and buy a pub or you know anything we can find that we can get for a pound. Why wouldn't we just buy it? And of course, they were sort of uh, all saying, whoa, whoa, Jeremy, calm down. You know, we're a telecoms company. Let's stick to telecoms businesses. And I was arguing, look, if it's free, take it. <laughs> you know, why would we? Uh, why would we discriminate against what it is? Um, we should, uh, you know, we should we should pick up anything we can. Um, and eventually, they kind of talked me down to, okay, let's go for telecoms companies or IT companies. And so I, I had it in my head, okay, we can have a telecoms company or an IT company. And then I'm super tuned in to every conversation that, that I'm I'm having. And anyway, um, a couple of weeks later, we're doing uh, interviews for account, a new account manager role. And um, uh, and basically, uh, I'm not allowed to give interviews on my own because I just talk at them for two hours and then offer them the job. So the operations director was in the room to actually ask them some questions and make it more like a, a grown-up sort of interview. Um, and uh, the guy comes in and his CV that he hands us, or resume, um, has his name and then his current employment is basically his name IT company. Um, and so, you know, so, so he's obviously self-employed in an IT company. And so I immediately jump on it and go, tell me about the IT company. And he says, oh, well, you know, there's just um, me and two engineers. Um, we do network installations and IT support uh, for people. Um, uh, basically, you know, uh, it's been going for the last five years, blah, 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 blah. And I just said, well, why are you applying for a job then? And he said, well, my wife is having a baby. And so the room that I call the office, she calls the nursery. <laughs> and, um, and also she would quite like me to be home at sensible uh, time every day to have a fixed salary so she doesn't have to worry about whether they can buy nappies or baby formula and things like that. So he said, I've decided just to... Uh, you know, pack it in and get a and get a job. And I said, well, what are you going to do with the business? He goes, I haven't really decided. I'm either going to wind it down or just give it to the engineers or or something like that. Um, and I was just like, fuck! Can you believe this? This guy's just walked in off the street and he's you know got the perfect business for us and he doesn't even want it. So it's going to be uh, you know the easiest deal we ever do. So I kind of say to um, I say to the guy, do you mind giving us a minute? You know, if you, if you step outside the room, I'd like to have a discussion with my operations director. And so he steps outside the room and I turn around to the ops director and go, wow, you know, can you believe that? And he just goes, yeah, he'd be a great account manager. And I'm like, fuck, you're not even in the same conversation as me. <laughs> it's like, um, and I described it as I tuned into DLFM and all I could see was, you know, all I could see were these deals around me. Um, but other people don't seem to, you know, they can have an entire conversation like that with someone. And because they're only thinking down you know, what they're trying to solve, which is that they want a new account manager. That was all he could see in that conversation was the qualities around how good an account manager they would be. But I've just done a deal and I've just explained to this person why that deal was great and that we should look for, you know, more opportunities. And the opportunity sat right in front of him for an hour and, and they couldn't see it. And, and I think this is happening in you know, so many scenarios where you're so obsessed with the thing that you're doing or the thing that you're going to say that you're not listening to what the other person is saying. And uh, and sometimes it's it's a deal in disguise and you're not, um, yeah, you're not seeing it. Yeah, thanks for um, thanks for sharing that story. And it's, uh, you, you talk about it uh, in the book really, really well as well. Um, we'll dive into one of the things that you, you talk about. You say you don't make money running businesses. You make money when you sell them. And one of the stories you talk about is Richard Branson and how he was on borderline uh, insolvency before selling Virgin Music for half a billion dollars, which is back in those days was considered a lot of money as well. So can you touch on why, uh, you know, you don't make money running businesses, you actually make money selling businesses or, or buying businesses? Yeah, so this was a big learning curve for me because I was an accumulator or an empire builder. And so I would constantly, you know, add these companies, take a bit of extra money from them every month. And so my income would be growing and growing as I as I grew my little uh, empire. And I just thought I'd keep them forever. You know, and in fact, there was a, you know, Warren Buffett quote kind of ringing in my ears where he said the best time to sell a good business is never, you know, that you should always hold a good business. And so I was thinking like, right, OK, I've got to do that. What I hadn't realized is what he means by a good business is, Apple, 
or Coca-Cola, not some shitty air conditioning company in, you know, in the west of England or something like this. So I had kind of misinterpreted his advice and was trying to shoehorn it into what I was uh, doing. And uh, I actually joked with someone once when I, when I grew this group of 12 companies, I mean, I, I was run ragged in terms of how busy I was. If you imagine, you know, in any company, the CEO of the company basically only gets to deal with the shittiest of, of problems. And I was effectively the CEO of 12 companies. So I had 12 companies relentlessly bringing me their shittiest, most unsolvable problems on a, on a daily basis. So my entire day, you know, it was breakfast, lunch and dinner of, you know, shit sandwiches, basically. <laughs> so it was just, I hope, I hope you're allowed to swear on your show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the uh, uh, yeah, it was really uh, it was really really hard work, and um, and I actually said to to someone, you know, the thing I realised is that the worst, you know, the only thing worse than running one crappy business is running twelve crappy businesses, um, and uh, and that it was actually a big uh, uh, you know a big stretch. Um, but I still had this idea that you shouldn't be selling them anyway. I eventually got worn down to the point where I thought I've got to sell one of these, and so I sold one of them. Uh, and um, and it was like an epiphany because there were just so many lessons I got out of that sale. The, the first one is that um, you don't just sell a, a business for money, you get all your time back. Um, and it's that time benefit that combined with the money that makes you really, really powerful. Now, just like anything, a blessing can also be a curse. So you, you see a lot of entrepreneurs who get all their time and their money and they just don't know what to do. They haven't got anything else to go and do. So they buy the Aston Martin, get divorced, become an alcoholic, you know, all of the, the, that, that, you know, they, they kind of go down that route, uh, midlife crisis type of route. Um, whereas, uh, you know, I had a really exciting thing I wanted to do, which was buying and selling businesses. And so I was able to kind of reapply myself in that uh, uh, in that vein. Um, the other thing that I realized was actually um, income is just what you spend. So no matter how much income I was drawing out of these businesses, my lifestyle just adjusted to the new levels of income. So you have a nicer car, you have a nicer house, you do nicer things, you go on nicer holidays, you can be more generous uh, with your friends and with your family. Um, but ultimately, it doesn't actually impact your wealth very much. Um, whereas when you sell a business, when you create a capital event, that capital event gives you a lump sum of cash all in one go. So instead of getting the income on a monthly basis and it just disappearing, you have a lump of money that's much harder to dispose of. I mean, of course, you can just go and blow it on a, on a house or a bunch of cars or, or whatever. Um, but if you deploy that capital into you know, uh, traditional sort of investments that generate income, um, you can create an income stream that's not dependent on you doing stuff, that's not dependent on you working. So you can really make money in your, in your sleep. Uh, and that, that is a real game changer because that turns entrepreneurship, which ultimately entrepreneurship is, is pretty much getting up every day and rolling the fucking dice. Um, it turns entrepreneurship into financial freedom. Um, and one of the things that most entrepreneurs cr crave is financial freedom, but I think they think they're going to get it from running a business. And I don't think you do. I think you get it from selling a business. So I don't think you make money running businesses. I think you make money when you sell them. And that was the, that was kind of uh, the biggest epiphany and then people always you know jump out with that oh what about Mark Zuckerberg what about Elon Musk what about Bill Gates what about you know um, etc etc well actually they went public they IPO'd which is kind of selling the business because they're allowing the shares to be traded publicly so they're for sale um, and generally speaking they've either sold a chunk of their shares to take care of themselves or they're leveraging and borrowing money against their shares in those companies in order to go and diversify and do uh, other things so um uh, so in a way, you know, I think even in those kind of extreme examples, which I, I, don't, I never think is a good idea to benchmark yourself against, you know, Jeff Bezos or something, but um, but even in those extreme examples, they generally have taken care of their wealth through some sort of exit. So um, yeah, uh, I, I'm a big believer in that. Yeah, no, th thank you for sort of uh, making sense of that. But an another thing you touched on, which I'll just expand on. Tell us the importance of, as the entrepreneur, positioning himself as a shareholder in their business early so they can start moving up, uh, thinking strategically and position yourself as an investor. I think entrepreneurs don't see themselves as investors. They see themselves as builders, but really we're, we're, we're building something to sell, to exit, to raise capital. And as you said before, to regain our, our freedom and time back as well. So yeah, tell us the importance of positioning yourself as a, an investor and shareholder.
Yeah, so look, I think I think most entrepreneurs, uh, you know, start a business with two things in mind. One is financial freedom, and one is time freedom. Um, and then their business takes away all of their time and all of their money, um, and so they basically get kind of caught in this new uh, this new trap or prison um, that they've created themselves. And uh, and I think uh, most of that comes down to the fact that entrepreneurs are, are, are maybe a bit too much of a control freak or a bit too obsessed with controlling what goes on in the business now. Uh, entrepreneurs are very good at creating things, but once those things are created, they should really hand over to managers to then manage uh, those things. Because if the entrepreneur stays involved, they'll constantly keep changing things, which the staff and the customers don't tend to like as much as the entrepreneur does, and it tends to have a negative impact on the business. And I think that's you know why you see so many businesses plateau is because the entrepreneur doesn't get out of the way and start to you know to move on to other things. And most of the time, that's because they don't want to feel like unwanted or that they're not involved in the company anymore. And so my suggestion is to move from you know being in the business to being on the business and effectively taking a more strategic role. And that more strategic role should be focused on mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, and exits, because those four things can have order of magnitude impact on the shareholder value of the company. So then you're really starting to think like a shareholder of the business. So you know, if you do a merger, you can double the business in a day. If you do an acquisition, you could double the business in a day. Um, you do a joint venture, um, you can add massive value to the business um, going forward. So if you do an exit, you can create an, a capital event and a, and a load of wealth for yourself. So a really good test would be to look at your diary, your calendar, and look at all the meetings uh, you have in it, apart from podcasts, perhaps. Uh, perhaps. But those, are those meetings um, uh, or on the topic of mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, or exits? Um, and those are kind of the four things that you should be having meetings about in your diary. If you're, you know, if it's um, uh, staff-related matters, customer-related matters, product-related matters, they're all things that could be dealt with by competent managers and don't need the input of, of the entrepreneur. So I think it's a real, you know, and, and most entrepreneurs never take that step. They stay in their business till, till the day they die. Um, but I think it's a really important run on the entrepreneurial ladder that uh, where, where it's worth having a look, but juice is worth the squeeze. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for breaking that down. That makes complete sense uh, with what you just said, that the, four, the notes I got from that, the four mediums is mergers, acquisitions, joint ventures, and exits. And everything else you can just leave up to the competent managers that you employ in the business to the run. Um, a real business owner is, uh, someone asked me this question today, they said, if you could leave your business for three months and come back to it, are you earning the same amount of money? Money, And is your business still going or in the toilet? Uh, if it's not, then you're self-employed, you don't really have a business. And I think entrepreneurs confuse the term business owner versus self-employed. Uh, most of them are self-employed. Anyway, going back to a cool story, in uh, 2009, you bought an air conditioning business for one pound on an angel investment website. Um, how did you fix up its cash flow problems and sell it? What, what Do you remember that particular business? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, it was, uh, uh, funnily enough, they were looking for investment and we approached them and asked them what they needed the investment for. They wanted the investment to fill a big black hole in their balance sheet that they've created, that they'd created. Um, obviously, um, yeah, that was the time of the global financial crisis and they supplied a lot of uh, very well-known retailers um, and quite a few of those retailers were closing stores or certainly uh, holding back on capital expenditure and it, and it caused quite a few problems uh, in the business um, to the point where actually the staff hadn't been paid for a couple of months at this point so they really were on the brink of uh, uh, the brink of falling over um, and very simply I mean we went in um, and the first thing we did was we prioritized the payment to the staff so what was happening was they were, uh, I call it the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So the person that rings up and moans and complains the most gets paid um, rather than paying things in the, in the correct order. So the first thing we did is we just reprioritized payment and we paid the staff first and then we started to deal with other creditors and, and taking care of stuff. Um, now, they'd had a rump of debt. The, the business was actually profitable, but they had this rump of debt that was left over from the fact that they, they, their size had changed dramatically. They, they'd gone from about three and a half million in revenue to just under a million of revenue in a, in a few months. Um, and so whilst they downsized, they'd actually moved to a smaller premises and got rid of some staff and some vans and some other things. 
um, they hadn't downsized quick enough. And as a result, they carried those extra expenses for two or three months. And that, that was now sitting there as money owed to, uh, uh, to creditors and to um, uh, the government and things like that. So um, we used something called a creditor's voluntary arrangement. And a creditor's voluntary arrangement is a kind of, I guess you'd describe it as not quite bankruptcy. Um, it's a court approved repayment plan with your creditors, where typically you pay back a percentage of what you owe over a long period of time. And the best way to describe it is that, you know, you might owe half a million to maybe 20, 30 different uh, uh, organizations. You might owe them half a million today. Under the court approved repayment plan, you maybe have to pay back 200 grand instead of 500. And instead of paying it today, you pay it in equal installments over the next five years. So it has a transformative impact on the balance sheet and cash flow of the business once it's, uh, once it's implemented. Um, and it does require you know, careful negotiation with the creditors to get it set up. Um, insolvency practitioners can help you with that process of, of uh, liaising with all of the creditors and getting them over the line. You only need 70% of the creditors to agree with it, and 100% of the creditors are then bound by it. So what you can actually do is put the plan together. Typically, that 70% is normally, you know, it's the 80-20 rule. 20% um, of, the, of the creditors owe, are owed 80% of the money. So you can typically um, target a very small number of the creditors and get them over the line and, and be safe and secure that the whole proposal is going to be accepted. And ultimately, you know, from a creditor perspective, if the CBA is, it doesn't go through and they don't agree to it, then generally speaking, the business is going to go into insolvency and they're going to get nothing. Um, you know, it will, it will collapse and the people lose their jobs and the customers don't get what they've paid for. And, you know, it, it, it turns into a bit of a shit show. So um, it is in everybody's interest to try and rescue um, these businesses. And one of the big advantages I found uh, was actually not being the founder of the company, but being this kind of third party or angel, if you like, that's come in at the last minute to try and rescue stuff because the, the, the person in the business had kind of burned every possible bridge with those suppliers to the point where, you know, there, there was almost uh, – a, a sort of an angry kind of um, sentiment between them where they couldn't have a civil conversation with each other. Whereas me coming in completely out of the blue, I was able to have those conversations and it would be you know, completely different. It was kind of the previous owner could bring them up and say, I'm going to pay you on Tuesday. And it would turn, turn into a shouting match. I would ring them up and say, I'm going to pay you on Tuesday. And they'd say, oh, thank God you're involved. It's so nice to have somebody that's dealing with this. You know? <laughs> um, it, would, it would be like night and night and day. So, um, so yeah, it's a very, it, it, it was, um, that, that was basically what we did. It was a fairly, uh, fairly straightforward uh, process. But there are lots and lots of different kind of financial engineering techniques and things like that that you can use to rescue businesses. But yeah, that was what we did in that particular case. Yeah, awesome. And some of the notes I got from that, like when you when you go into a business like that, you're going in not emotionally. You're you're going in sort of financially, understanding the situation. You're not the founder. Um, you can see things that they can't see. Uh, so that's the other benefit as well. Um, in the book, you talk about why you shouldn't seek businesses for sale, and instead, where should you seek and source businesses and deals? What's the Let's say someone's listening to this, they go out and purchase your books. You've done multiple books and uh, I'll talk about sort of the Harbour Club soon, but let's say they go, you know what? I wanna start looking for businesses. Where should people start seeking businesses if they want to buy? Yeah, so literally direct outreach to entrepreneurs who own businesses. So, uh, you know, the target is owner managed businesses. Typically, um, the easiest ones to buy are ones that are doing less than five million a year in revenue because there's no natural market for those. The you know private equity aren't involved. Large corporates don't buy that size of uh, of business. So there's there's a, a, a very um, yeah they're, they're they're not very sellable um, basically. So um, and just reach out to the entrepreneurs directly and just have a conversation with them about life, the universe, and everything. No no agenda. You don't have to bring them up and say I want to buy your company. You can ring them up and just say um, I'm looking at getting involved in your industry. I'm thinking of you know putting a group of companies together in your sector i'd love to pick your brains about you know the challenges that face your industry and what's going on and you know build build rapport and have a conversation with them the businesses that are for sale so the ones that are advertised through brokers or on websites that are already for sale um, generally speaking they're overpriced they often have their financials manipulated um, often business brokers like to uh, publish something they call adjusted ebit or adjusted ebitda um, which is 
basically accounting fraud. Um, they basically take the accounts and they remove all the things that they think you wouldn't have to pay if you owned the business. And then they say that's the profit that it's producing. And then they multiply that up by a completely unrealistic uh, amount um, and you end up with a massively overvalued business. And unfortunately, that business owner now thinks he's getting three million for his tiny little company. Um, and it's all going to be cash or check, you know, it's not, uh, and, and they haven't thought that possibly it's worth 10% of that and that they're not going to get it all at once. Um, and it's very hard to talk people back from that position. I mean, interestingly, um, businesses sold through brokers and 90% of the cases don't sell for exactly those reasons. The 10% that do sell, I believe, are the ones that, are, you know, where the business owner actually is desperate to sell and therefore accepts an offer um, that, that's bought to them. But generally speaking, uh, it's not a very efficient way of selling businesses uh, for either the buyer or the seller. Yeah, you also talk in the book about the Harvard Business School teaches 126 different valuation models, and all of them are wrong. Uh, it's because very simply, uh, value in a business, um, a business is worth what somebody pays for it, which is pretty, pretty, pretty simple. Um, if someone can see the value of a business in a in a thirty year time frame and say, you know, like Warren Buffett going back to here, he buys companies that are going to be around for generations, not companies that are only going to be around for a couple of years. So someone might see the value of holding the business for decades versus someone might only see the value of just flipping the business as well. Um, there's so much to unpack in this book. It's 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 really really amazing. Some of the quotes I got as well. You talk about every dollar you'll ever make is in someone else's pocket right now. Uh, I really like that as well. Um, yeah, and some of the things you talk about, the importance of just building rapport with, with owner managers that, that run businesses like entrepreneurs and solving their problem in exchange to getting their business as a result. Um, how important is rapport and sort of building that win-win scenario when having those conversations with business owners that uh, want to sell and where you want to buy? Yeah, it's essential. Um, so... Uh, I, I guess there's two kind of types of acquisition you can do. There's corporate M&A, which is basically where two groups of advisors get together, thrash out a deal, and then it's put to the shareholders to vote on. Or there's an owner manager, which is a guy who owns the company or a couple of people that own the company um, and you do the deal with them. Now, in that corporate environment, you can be an asshole and nobody will really care because they're going to propose the deal to the shareholders. The shareholders never going to know that you're an asshole. Um, but when you're dealing with an owner manager, they can they can say yes or no, and that's it. The, the 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 deal happens or it doesn't happen. And so, you know, generally speaking, entrepreneurs they're they're not they're no fools. You know, you don't build a business for a decade or uh, or more um, and, uh, and and be an idiot. So they generally they've seen everything. They know what uh, you know. They're smart. They know what's going on. And so, if you try and approach it in the wrong way or you don't. Uh, create the kind of the trust and rapport with them, there's no way you're going to get a deal with them. They're not going to trust you. They're not going to believe you. Um, they, you know, mo most business owners have been scammed. They've been, you know, uh, lied to and, uh, and they, they're very good at spotting people that are trying uh, to do that. And, and, and so, yeah, you need to build that trust. You need to build that rapport and you need to be genuine and, and transparent with them uh, from the outset about what you're trying to achieve and how you're trying to achieve it. Otherwise, uh, yeah, they'll see through you in a, in, a, in a second. Yeah, one of the cool stories you tell in the book is about a, a 72 year old man selling his business for 1.2 million pounds and how Jim got the deal done by structuring the deal correctly first and then building rapport with the daughter and the accountant who had some issues. Um, and basically the, the, the takeaway I got from that was showing them that he was in a safe pair of hands. So that phrase is so undervalued in life and business, a safe pair of hands. What was your take on sort of having those safe pair of safe pair of hands and then showing that the not the just not just the business owner selling it but the family that that business will will continue and that you know the the deal is between two people sort of um having that understanding and, and rapport so yeah talk a little bit about safe pair of hands yeah, absolutely. So, uh, I mean, in that case, it was, uh, yeah, getting the stakeholders on board um, was as important as getting the owner on board, because I think the, you know, the stakeholders felt he was old and potentially going to make stupid decisions. I think he was actually very uh, bright and, and compass mentis. And, and actually, I mean, you know, OK, the safe pair of hands things is absolutely about building that rapport and that trust, uh, you know, with the better business owner and, and demonstrating that you would be the most credible candidate to buy the business. Um, but interestingly, the thing I think that got that deal done 
was that the guy was asking for a very reasonable price for the business. Um, the, the, it was doing about 300 grand a year of profit. It had assets on the balance sheet, it had cash in the bank, a couple of hundred grand of cash in the bank, and it owned its own real estate. It owned 1.1 million pounds worth of, of real estate that the business um, sat on. And he was only asking for um, 1.7 million, I think it was, in, in total. And um, the, uh, everybody else that approached it just tried to do a, a leverage buyout. Now, leverage buyouts are the most common form of uh, no money down acquisition. You basically just borrow money from the bank and you give it to the owner and, uh, and, and you're done. Um, and, you know, if, as your audience likes books, there's about 380 books on Amazon on the topic of leverage <laughs> buyouts. So it's a very well known, very well worn path. And um, so what people would do is they would just look at all those assets and figure out how much they could borrow against it. And so, and then they would just offer him that low, and effectively it's lowballing him. He wants 1.7 and they're going, I'll give you 800 grand or 900 grand or a million. Um, and he's going, no, it's 1.7 and the property's worth 1.1 and there's cash in the bank and it's got a balance sheet and it makes profit every year. Um, so he really wasn't asking for, for something unreasonable. And I think that the tipping point um, in that deal was actually offering him his headline. So offering to get him to his number and then just showing away a path to get to that number. Now the path to get to that number didn't involve giving him any cash up front and that was the rub. Um, but we got him, you know, it was getting him to his headline and then giving him the security over the business. So, you know, a legal charge back over the property. So if there was a default, he could get 1.1 million of property back. Well, that, that goes a long way to making good on the whole transaction. Um, and, um, and also, you know, making it self-financing for the buyer. So I think the, what, what was happening with the other deals, because he'd had, he'd had it sort of tentatively for sale for two years and had met loads of people that had tried to buy it. And I think the uh, the reason that the, the deal went through, like I say, was that somebody actually listened to him. He explained he wanted 1.7. He explained how he got to that number. He explained the, uh, the, the, the makeup of it, and it made perfect sense. It actually tra translated to only about a year's worth of profit uh, on top of the actual cash and assets that the business held. Um, and, um, you know, so he wasn't being greedy. Um, but everybody else was trying to lowball him. And then one person listened to him and got him to his number, got him to where he wanted to go. And I think that was, that was the crucial part of it, is, is listening to the other person and giving them what they want. And, and you're 90% of the way there. Yeah, and it, and it goes to show collaborating, not competing as well. Um, in the book, yeah, you talk about so many things, such as the deal pie. A lot of people don't realize there's so many different ways you can structure a deal, uh, you know, financially speaking, and, and buyers of a, sellers of a business don't know there's so many different ways that they can get that particular money. They think it's cash up front, here's the keys, see you later, I'm going on holidays or retiring. Um, yeah, probably the, the last thing I probably want to talk about is sort of the, you, you talk about in the book as well with Bill Gates, he said, what is the... Um, what's the number one thing that was created in the last hundred years? And he talked about a uh, limited liability company. Do you want to talk a little bit about that and why that invention Bill Gates says is the most sort of significant thing that's happened in the last hundred years? Yeah, well, so look, an interviewer asked Bill Gates, yeah, the most significant invention of the last hundred years, and of course expected him to say the internet or the computer, personal computer or something related to his industry. And his answer was the limited liability company. And actually, you can track pretty much human development back to the creation of the limited liability company. So um, if you think before that existed, every single um, bet you made, every single business deal you did had unlimited uh, downside potential to it, and if you you know if you go back a few hundred years, there was actually debtors' prison. So if you owed money, they put you in prison, um, and uh, so you could literally go be, go from being moderately wealthy um, to being in prison over a business deal or trying to set up a business. And so this created you know horrible inequality and uh, uh, and you know a, a very unentrepreneurial environment. They came up with this idea of limited liability companies, which are, which effectively is creating a legal entity that can behave like a natural person. Um, so a legal entity that can enter into agreements, can, um, uh, you know, uh, yeah, behave, behave like a person would, um, and, but with downside protection. And of course, um, you know, all of the um, ships that used to go abroad and bring back, um, you know, spices and other exotic things back to the UK could then be formed as uh, limited companies and protect the investors downside so they could only lose the money that they invested. Um, and you can pretty much track 
the uh, entire industrial revolution from that moment forwards, the whole uh, the whole world basically be began this massive springboard out of poverty. Um, and I mean, if you look at um, you know a thousand years ago, 99% of the world were in were, were in absolute poverty, which is not being able to even you know, barely feed themselves. And you go to now, and it's pretty much the other way around. Um, so uh, it has been you know fan fantastic for human development. But most importantly for entrepreneurs, it means that you're not necessarily having to stick your entire life on the roulette table on black or red, um, spin the wheel um, every morning when you get up and and, um, and go and do your business because your downside is protected by the limited liability of your company. Now, banks and financial institutions are doing their best to destroy the sanctity of, of limited liability because now when you borrow money, quite often they ask for personal guarantees. Um, around uh, those things, but uh, I'm, hope, I'm hoping that things are starting to get better because you have um, there's some nice European legislation that came out, which is uh, uh, forces financial institutions to remove people from personal guarantees under certain circumstances. Um, there's quite a few situations now where you can limit your personal guarantee. They used to be unlimited, whatever the bank could think of to add. To the to the to the bill, they could just stick all sorts of charge. You know, you, you borrowed fifty grand and you owe the bank one hundred and fifty when the dust settles. Um, uh, they've got rid of uh, those kind of things, um, and there's now personal guarantee insurance you can take out as well. So um, there are things that are kind of uh, I think helping a little bit of a fight back in that area. But I still think that um, financial institutions shouldn't be able to take personal guarantees. But um, uh, but that will be a tough a tough sell. Um, but yeah, uh, limited, limited liability companies are very, very useful for, for entrepreneurs. Yeah, thanks for expanding on that and breaking that down as well. Uh, just to switch gears for a second, in 2009, you founded the Harbour Club, uh, where you teach a high-level course. Can you give us some in insight to sort of uh, what this is and, and what's it all about? Yeah, so it's actually, it's not so much a course as a community. Um, so we have about 2,000 entrepreneurs all around the world from uh, mainly English-speaking countries, so Australia, New Zealand, Singapore, UK, US, Canada, but people in all other countries as well. We have uh, most of Europe and several other uh, places. Um, but uh, uh, basically, they uh, we all have an app and we all uh, announce our deals. We talk about deals that we're working on and share ideas and evolve, you know, answer each other's questions and support each other to get uh more deals uh, done. It came about really because um, I kept buying companies and people were uh, coming to me and asking me to come and work for them. So they would say, you know, can you come and be a non-exec? Can you be an advisor for us? We want you to help us buy businesses. And I was just thinking, I can't think of why on earth I'd ever want to do that. And then um, uh, I actually bought a company that did seminars that ran business training uh, seminars. And that was when the kind of penny dropped that, okay, maybe a way to deal with all these people that want to give me a job is to do a seminar on how to buy and sell companies. They can come along to it and I can be proud if they go off and do, you know, uh, deals. So in 2009, I started the Harbour Club and did a you know a three day course on how to buy and sell companies and it went down really really well. Um, people were astonished by all these different kind of you know tactics and strategies for getting these deals done without using capital and without borrowing money from banks and, and things like that. Um, and it just took on a life of its own. And uh, uh, and like I say, we turned it into a community in twenty. 13, which is very collaborative, lots of people sharing content, sharing best practice. In 2020, for the first time, although we were a mergers and acquisitions community, we measured exits. So we got everybody that wanted to volunteer their information uh, to send details of deals they'd done to PKF, which is the 17th largest accounting firm in the world. Um, because we have deals in lots of different countries, we have to use an international uh, audit firm. Um, they would send their, the details of their deal in, and then PKF would verify them, and then it went into a, a report. And we had 34 people that contributed uh, information to that report, and a total of $78 million in exits that were done in 2020. Um, makes it all the more astonishing because 2020 was full COVID year, where most 70% of the planet was locked down at one point. Um, and so uh, I actually think it was probably quite a tough environment for selling companies, very good environment for buying companies, lots of acquisitions were done. And I know many people in the community didn't share uh, information on deals because they wanted to, you know, they didn't want that information going anywhere. Um, but the ones that did, it was it was astonishing. So we really are creating um, lots of uh, millionaires and, and wealth for our members. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic, uh, like I say, taken on a life of its own. It's a, it's a fantastic group. Awesome. And how do people uh, find out more if, uh, let's say, someone wants to join? Is there, how, how do people go about that? 
Yeah, just go to harbourclubevents.com. Um, so harbour is spelled the British way, H-A-R-B-O-U-R. So harbourclubevents.com. And uh, yeah, register your interest on there and, uh, and you can go through the process. We are an anti-seminar in that uh, we only have uh, one entry price point. So you, you join the Harbour Club and you're a member forever. Um, uh, I, I get very annoyed by these seminar companies where you think you're going to get something and then they just constantly try to upsell you, upsell you. You have to buy the diamond, platinum, gold thing and all that stuff. Um, as an entrepreneur, that used to drive me crazy. So I've always vowed that I would never do that. So we, uh, we have a really straightforward we're not, a, we're not a proper training company. Um, we're a, yeah, a membership organization and uh, there's nothing else you can buy from us. So we, there's no relentless upsell. No, got it. Well, you've got a lot of content out there as well. Getting back to books, uh, I know we're running out of time, so we'll wrap it up really quickly. Uh, talk about when your first book came out or just your, your book order and then what's the next book coming out as well. I think your first book is called, um, is it Go Do? Yeah, yeah. So GoDo was uh, was a funny one because uh, I was approached out of the blue by the publisher to say, "Hey, um, we'd like you to write a book, and we're going to pay you." And I was like, "Sure, okay, I can do that." Um, and uh, and then they said, "We want you to write about startups." And I said, "Well, I pretty regularly stand on stage telling people not to start businesses, <laughs> but to buy them instead." And they said, "Oh, okay, but we'd really like you to write a book about startups." And so I wrote GoDo as the the compassionate kick up the ass to people who are not entrepreneurs. To become entrepreneurs so it was very much uh, uh, getting people or trying to inspire people with the kind of entrepreneurial um, bug um, and then uh, I wrote an ebook called um, why you should never buy a business that's for sale um, and then I circled back and wrote the book that I'd originally wanted to write um, which I called go do deals which is the, what we've just been talking about which is the book I would have written for the publisher if, uh, if they'd given me a free reign um, and it's uh, yeah how to buy companies without uh, lawyers or leverage. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, and, and it was fantastic. Actually, we uh, when we released it, we uh, were number three on the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. Um, and in that week, number one was Barack Obama. So uh, it was quite a good, uh, yeah, it was quite a, a busy time to release a book. So it was um, great to get to, uh, get to Great to be on the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list. Um, and then uh, I've written another book, which I actually, I wrote the guts of it, I guess you could say, about two years ago, um, which is called Democratizing Wealth. Um, and uh, I'm really, really excited about that, but it's um, uh, th there's still a lot of work to be done. It still needs quite a major um, edit. Um, we've already got the publishers all lined up and they're chasing me for the <laughs> chasing me for the edit um we've already postponed the uh, the release a couple of times because i keep doing deals which soaks up all my all my time but democratizing wealth is about um uh, basically how to solve global inequality um and how to use entrepreneurship and the fact that entrepreneurs are change agents how to empower them to make the world uh, a, a better place um and so it, you know it does touch on economics and politics and stuff like that a little bit but it's uh, it's a really really fascinating area uh, for me and, uh, and researching it was uh, was really interesting in terms of just understanding where all the money is in the world and how we can potentially unlock that and get it into the hands of, of ordinary people so um, yeah it's been a fascinating uh, journey in terms of putting it together well when it comes out we'll have another conversation because that's that's another story about how much money is actually locked away that we don't know that we just got to get that money released and uh, yeah, anyway, uh, where can people find uh, more? Is it sort of the website, jeremyharbour.com, or uh, is that the best place for, to reach you and um, check out your stuff? Yeah, jeremyharbour.com, or hit me up on any of the social media um, channels, which uh, you can find me by the same name. There's a, there's a verified uh, Instagram. I think it's Harbour Jeremy, maybe. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll find it. <laughs> H-A-R-B-O-U-R, not the American spelling. Got it, got it. Well, Jeremy, thanks for being a great guest on the Best Book Biz podcast. Thanks for your time. Thanks for all your success and the future success as well. And yeah, teaching people out there, um, you know, not just business owners, entrepreneurs, people how to sell businesses, had people how to buy businesses as well. Um, yeah, really, really great stuff. And yeah, to my audience, go out there, buy his books, consume his content and follow Jeremy on social as well. So again, thanks very much, Jeremy, and I'll speak to you soon. Wonderful. Thank you very much.